Uh, my name is Dr. Main. I'm the current pediatric ENT fellow at Red Cross UCT. So I'll be presenting on uh, pediatric subglottic stenosis today. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so there are no disclosures and uh, all images and videos are courtesy of UCT and Red Cross uh, Children's Hospital. So we'll start with a case presentation. So we have an 11 month old girl who was a second born, was a second twin, was involved in a shark fire burn and sustained injuries to the head and face and hands, and then had to be intubated at the scene, taken to the hospital, intubated for five days. And upon extubation was found to have uh, this biphasic strider, which wasn't resolving on uh, nebulization or steroids, even on uh, non-invasive ventilation, which was still persisting. And so we decided to go ahead and do a direct laryngotracheal bronchoscopy uh, with plus or minus endoscopic uh, intervention. And what we found was, you can see clearly, um, a sub, uh, subglottic stenosis, the, the supraglottis and glottis is normal and, and a clear view of the subglottic uh, stenosis. So uh, when it comes to subglottic stenosis and when it comes to intervention, endoscopic intervention, talking about balloon dilation, then you ask yourself, uh, is it necessary? Is it something that will work? Um, so normally the ones which are So that one is a candidate for uh, balloon uh, dilation. And in when it came to balloon dilation, we used the non-occlusive uh, balloon dilator, as you can see uh, in this video. Sometimes you can be able to, on the stenosis, you can be able to um, make a, a small incision just to make it a bit wider before you put in your, your balloon. And as you can see, um, you're able to uh, use insufflate the balloon and um, you normally count two minutes um, to, so that you can be able to achieve an adequate, um, the main aim here is to achieve an adequate airway and expand the airway so that it can be, you can, uh, you can be able to achieve a good diameter and radius. So the benefits of the non-occlusive balloon dilation, as you could see, it could be able to permit uh, ventilation during the dilation. And at the same time, it's also suitable for children who have this low reserve, especially those ones who are unable to uh, sustain an, um, um, good periods of ventilation for a very long time. And uh, it's the same as the, uh, using an occlusive balloon dilation. And the advantage of this is also you don't need pre-oxygenation because you're able to permit ventilation and the outcome is equally as good as in those traditional occlusive balloon dilations. And as you can see the outcome, this is what we want to achieve, a good airway. And um, it, it was cotton Myers 3, now it's looking like a cotton Myers 1, perfectly okay. And uh, you, are, you expect good results out of this with a good prognosis. So we normally do it at two minute intervals. Um, we do it uh, two, min uh, two minutes, uh, we do it twice mostly. And normally we don't require any rescue intubation. And um, what happened in this child, that was what was done and then was transported back to ICU uh, and was put into non-invasive ventilation. And the non-invasive ventilation is usually wind off after 24 hours. Uh, other, you can also add also proton pump inhibitors, which we normally use, ciprofloxacin, dexamethasone uh, nebulization, and also steroids. And the child recovered well, post-op review was fine, and the child has remained asymptomatic ever since. So let's go to our discussion, uh, endolaryngeal options of subglottic stenosis. And um, we can start with a bit of anatomy. The differences between an adult airway and a child's airway is quite, uh, quite commonly known. The airway of a child is usually more anterior. It's more higher in the neck. And uh, it's usually funnel shaped compared to an adult, which is more of a cylindrical like shape. And as you can see in a child's airway, the subglottic region is usually the narrowest part uh, of the airway and it's a complete uh, ring. So that makes it more vulnerable to it being having the, the a reduced re reduction in radius also um, makes it more vulnerable to as worse effects of a stenosis. 
And as you can see um, in this uh, image, you can see a two millimeter change compared a, a two millimeter change in a child compared to a two millimeter change in an adult will have the, uh, adverse effects in a child compared to an adult. It will actually decrease by 75% in terms of cross section compared to an adult with 30%. So it increases 16 fold in resistance. And remember, I think push is slow, uh, resistance is inversely proportional to the radius. So any minor change, any minor change in a child's airway has more adverse effects compared to an adult. So when it comes to subnautic stenosis, we talk of two types. We have the congenital one and then we have the acquired one. So when it comes to congenital, we have two types. We have the membranous one and we have the cartilaginous one. The membranous one is usually more um, in kind of a circumferential one and it has a, a fibrous tissue and also hyperplastic glands involved. And uh, it appears uh, a bit circumferential compared to the cartilaginous one. The cartilaginous one is more of a defect in the cartilage, in the cricoid cartilage and has this shelves, these lateral shelves like appearance. Quite commonly, we see the cartilaginous type and it's pretty much a, a diagnostic feature of a congenital subglotic stenosis. So when it comes to acquired uh, subglotic stenosis, uh, just a bit of background of the history. Uh, McDonald and Stokes in the, in the mid 60s, uh, what they proposed was uh, that neonates and children should undergo prolonged ventilation for lower respiratory tract infections. Now, what the consequence of this is we saw an increased incidence in subglotic stenosis, increased to almost 12 to 20 percent uh, in terms of uh, incidence. And so uh, this led to now development of techniques to be able to repair the subglotic stenosis. And so in the late 70s, uh, uh, pioneered by Cotton, uh, they started now doing laryngotracheoplasties, ways to see whether how we can be able to resolve the issue of subglotic stenosis surgically. It wasn't, it wasn't the first time laryngotracheoplasties were done, it was just that it was now enhanced more because uh, in the early 20th century, Killian had developed the cricoid split before, but it became now more prominent in the 70s after this increased incidence of uh, subglotic stenosis. So currently there is a decrease in prevalence now that we know that prolonged ventilation uh, intubation can cause uh, stenosis. There have been advancements in neonatal care and um, the endotracheal tube, we know that you should select both an age-appropriate ETT tube and a weight-appropriate ETT tube and with pressures, and it should have pressures below 20 to 25 centimeters of water, when uh, which should be appropriate. So when it comes to risk factors, of course, we have talked about intubation injury, also meconium aspiration uh, in birth, burns, Gastroesophageal reflux disease is also a common um, risk factor, and that's why we normally also give them PPIs. So the incidence currently is usually 0 to 2%. Some texts put it at 1.8%, and these are some of the images of an acquired uh, subglotic stenosis. So you can see in this video, after 10 days, this is a burns patient. You can see the slough, the edema around. And normally what happens in, in this kind of situations, you can see in this one, the premature child had this posterior glottic band and also had this subglottic cysts uh, with narrowing of the airway. All these are intubation injuries. Remember, during intubation, the child's head is moving, the larynx is moving, and this causes the, the injuries. So when it comes to pathophysiology, we all know um, the pediatric airway, the, the reason why the subglottis is prone to injury, um, it's, a, it's a constricted space. Uh, it has you know, stratified ciliated columnar epithelia, quite friable, uh, poor blood supply. So whenever there's uh, any pressure necrosis around, around there, you get edema and then you get ulceration. And this limits the uh, ciliary, normal ciliary flow, leading to now infection, perichondritis and the exposed cartilage. And this leads to cartilaginous necrosis. And how does this heal? It heals by secondary intention, not by primary intention, because um, it has the, the cricoid also has a poor blood supply. So it heals mostly by secondary intention and you get this granulation fibrous tissue, which now leads to the subglotic stenosis, which now comes up with the subglotic uh, cysts. So when it comes to diagnostic evaluation, um, you have to take your history. Of course, our perinatal inquiry is important. Um, Preterm children are more vulnerable, history of intubation, 
um, any recurrent illnesses or croup is also um, an indicator that uh, probably there's some um, it, it's a, it's a, a, there's a um, history of probably a, there could be a subglottic stenosis and your, your history should be airway specific and um, you want to get to see whether there's any risk factors that were involved earlier on. And what we normally sometimes forget about also in asking on, in evaluating our history also feeding abnormalities because history of aspiration and reflux is also very important. And when it comes to preoperative workup, um, you have your imaging but mostly we usually start with the flexible nasal endoscopy where you want to see the dynamic view of the airway. You want to also do your chest x-ray and neck x-ray. In this illustration, you can see the inverted V appearance, which we call the stippled sign, typical of croup. And you can and when you're doing your flexible endoscopy, you can also do the swallowing assessment at the same time. But the main uh, the gold standard for evaluation is a direct laryngotracheal bronchoscopy. And in this instance, you want to evaluate uh, the larynx to the carina, all the way from the supraglottis, glottis, and subglottis to trachea, and all the way up to the carina. And in this instance, we are talking about, uh, since you're talking about the subglottis, we'll focus more on the subglottic region. So this is just an illustration. Um, this is how we put our local spray. Uh, we have done um, on to the valecular and also to the vocal cords. And uh, this is how we put them into suspension. We put them into suspension straight after the spray. Sometimes you can just go directly into suspension without, um, and then put the spray in when you're still in, uh, doing the suspension at the same time. This is the suspension tray. This is the port for ventilation for the anesthetic side. And this is a light source. And you have mounted your rescue tube. Uh, we usually use a three millimeter, 3.5 millimeter, depending on age and weight on a 2.7 millimeter scope. And this would be used in case there is need for intubation. So we have the uh, myocotton uh, staging system, which is we commonly know. Grade one is usually up to 50%. Grade two is 51 to 70%. Uh, grade three is 71 to 99%. And grade four, there is no detectable lumen. You can also use the myocotton staging system in terms of uh, uh, sizing up using the uh, endotracheal tube. And um, you, this is a Cincinnati airway card, whereby you have the edge and then you have the appropriate diameter that can be used. And depending on which the um, endotracheal tube is able to fit in, you can be able to calculate also objectively which myocotton grade it is using this card. So when it comes to management, we have uh, options of management, endoscopic, uh, then open. Open can be either an expansion procedure or a resection procedure or you can combine both endoscopic and open. And you also have the option of tracheostomy, which of course uh, is usually not so pleasant. So when it comes to management, you have to, there are many factors. You have the patient factors, the age, uh, the weight, um, you have the disease factors, you have uh, it's congenital, is it acquired, is it multi-level? Then you have the surgical skills available in the center, availability of equipment, availability of an intensive care unit. So when it comes to, we'll talk about more on the endoscopic management. We usually use it as our primary uh, treatment modality. And um, our aim also is to avert a tracheostomy in selective patients. And um, it's an urgent treatment with um, open airway reconstruction as well. It can be used uh, in that scenario. And there have been many advances from the 80s, 90s till now, uh, whereby it has improved over the years. So when it comes to grade one and grade two, there is a highly likelihood of uh, success compared to a grade three or four or multi-level stenosis where you more likely go to an open uh, reconstruction. So when it comes to balloons, this is, uh, this is a Boston Scientific uh, insufflator. You can see we are, this is an, an occlusive balloon used to dilate and they use it for same thing, two minutes. And then this is the non-occlusive balloon dilator. You can see it's, it, it was invented by Professor Darlene Lube. You can see it's able to permit ventilation and it's locally produced here. So balloon size also, you, you size it according to the age appropriate uh, air, uh, age appropriate ETT. Uh, let's say if a child is, is the ETT size is uh, 4.5. So maybe the, the outer diameter is probably 5.9. 
So you'll calculate it at like a six. So you'll add one if you are dealing with a subnautic stenosis. So you'll use a size seven millimeter balloon, or if it's a tracheal stenosis, stenosis, you'll add two. So it will be like an eight millimeter uh, balloon dilator. You'll also use the Cincinnati airway card, quite useful, and we use it here. So the good candidates for endoscopic balloon dilation are the ones, those ones who have uh, a, a soft stenosis, an immature scar, thin, uh, web-like. Those ones are quite uh, amenable to balloon dilation compared to those ones who have a firm mature scar or there's, there's structure involved, cartilage is involved, structural problems, uh, missing cartilage, or the stenosis is quite long or multiple level uh, air religion. Those ones are poor candidates for endoscopic balloon dilation. So we have a few studies here by Lang and Brietzke in 2014, where he noticed there was no association between uh, treatment success and age, no association between success and gender, or also prematurity. They're, it's, 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 they are not linked. And um, a minimum of uh, two dilations is usually required per patient. And and the ones who didn't, weren't so successful were the ones who had uh, gastroesophageal reflux or uh, had a low, had low weight or less than five kgs or multi-level disease or a higher grade of uh, uh, myocotone. And Avelino also noted in 2015 an overall success rate of 60% with a higher success in acute versus a chronic uh, mature scar. So this is just an, an illustration of um, an endoscopic intervention using balloon dilation. So, and you can see we are also monitoring. We also have a, we can also monitor the same way the anesthetist scan. And um, when it comes to endoscopic expansion procedures, this one you want to avert a tracheostomy and use it in the younger patients where balloon dilation might not be effective on its own. And in this one, you, probably the patient has been having recurrent admissions for croup and you need a good uh, intensive care unit for this. So you can be able to do an anterior cricoid split or a posterior cricoid split with balloon dilation. Um, and the posterior cricoid split you use, you have to uh, use with a costal cartilage graft interposition. So this is an illustration of an anterior cricoid split. Uh, endoscopically, and as you can see, we are using what we call a sickle knife. You can also use sometimes you can also use even uh, micro scissors to do it. And there's an assistant who will help you to feel the cricoid and feel whether it has given way. And then you subsequently go ahead and do balloon dilation. And after that, you, you we normally do nasal intubation. Um, they go to ICU. They stay between three to five days. Then either the best practice is to extubate in theater, have a look and see then transfer back in, uh, in, with non-invasive ventilation. Sometimes they are extubated in ICU as well, depending on the circumstances. This is a posterior cricoid split. As you can see, there's posterior glottic stenosis, subglottic sub stenosis here, where now split was done, costal cartilage was harvested and inserted, and you can now be able to see an adequate airway and the graft is lying there quite nicely. So on our... Uh, in our local study here, since uh, December 2019, that's when we started using uh, non-occlusive balloon dilators. And it has been the standard of care in our endolaryngeal um, dilation for laryngotracheal stenosis. And uh, so this is the non-occlusive balloon dilator. It was invented by Professor Darlene Lube, and it's locally produced here. So this has been quite safe and effective. It has been a game changer for us, especially in those vulnerable children but it can be used for every, any patient, uh, not only that, just the vulnerable, but all the patients can be able to, to be done with it. And um, the aim for this study now, it was a two year retrospective study, uh, retrospective study, actually 30 months between December, 2019 and June, 2022. We wanted to describe the technique first and also evaluate the outcomes. And so we had uh, 32 uh, DLTB cases and all had undergone uh, endolaryngeal dilation procedures. It was a total of 29 children and uh, six of them had tracheostomies. And seven, seven of them we did simultaneous endoscopic expansion procedures, the anterior cricoid split, and then the balloon dilation. And then four out of the 29 had to undergo laryngotracheal uh, reconstruction. 
So the technique is the same. Uh, we put them into suspension and uh, the balloon dilation is done. Oxygen saturation had remained above 92% in all the cases. There was a bit of a deviation from pre dilation It was just less than 3%, but all of them remained above 92%. There was no risk intubation that was required in all the cases, and there was no point where DLTP was aborted. And the outcome, what we found was that um, 10 of the cases improved by two grades uh, and 15 uh, cases improved by one grade. And the ones who didn't improve the three, they had some bit of uh, framework stenosis and they were the poor candidates basically. So um, they didn't improve in, in, in the outcome. So we, 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 we concluded that it's a safe technique, a very effective technique, and it also permits ventilation throughout the procedure. And um, the risk is minimal. It has been minimized a lot. Uh, and it has improved safety in a very high risk population of these children. Most of them usually have a low respiratory uh, reserve. So what we started doing recently, actually, uh, it's because we realized that we weren't, in, we weren't able to measure uh, capnography. Uh, this is a patient we just did uh, recently, a uh, one year old, one year, two months, 8 kg child subnotic stenosis. You can see here, this is the, um, where the arrow is pointing to. This is the capno, uh, the, the tube for the capnograph. We, are we were trying to see whether we can be able to measure uh, capnography. And you can see where it's lying. It's lying just above the, at the supraglottic region, though we want it to lie a bit higher. And you can be able to see, we can be able to measure the, uh, cap the capnograph nicely. So it's something that we, we want to evaluate and see whether it could be useful. Would of, of course like the tube to lie a bit higher, not on the, uh, not on the, um, uh, on the path of where we are doing our balloon dilation. But that's an, um, what we, we have started doing right now. So when it comes to open airway reconstruction, um, we used it only, we use it when there's failed endoscopic uh, treatment. And also in those poor candidates for balloon dilations, the one we talked about, uh, firm mature scar, if there's cartilaginous airway narrowing or structural problems of the airway. Um, if you have those uh, uh, missing cartilage or a longer stenosis or multiple level airway lesions. So we go for an open airway reconstruction. And when it comes to open airway reconstruction, it's really either expansion or resection. And in expansion, uh, laryngotracheoplasty, you can either do an anterior cricoid split or posterior cricoid split, or you can combine both. It depends on the pathology. And then you have the option of cricotracheal resection. And this can also be done as a single stage or, or double stage, depending on whether you want to put a tracheostomy tube in place or not. So in summary, uh, we are talking about, uh, first of all, you, you individualize every patient has, a, has his or her own plan. You evaluate the symptoms, you evaluate the disease factors, and then you're able to, it could be able to uh, use it as a guide. Are, you, are we going to achieve it by endoscopic alone? Do we need open reconstruction? And of course, endoscopic cases that fail usually require an open area. And preoperative evaluation is crucial. Um, we normally, your history, uh, symptoms and signs and your flexible scope are very important. You want to check the vocal cord mobility, feeding and aspiration, and also rule out reflux disease. And most of these patients usually put them on proton pump inhibitors. Then there are patient factors. Remember, we come from uh, low socioeconomic status, our patients. Um, so, what you want to do is you want to give them a definitive surgery where possible. So if you can be able to give them something that will be able to reduce the clinic visits or operating time or operating visits or something like that, just definitive surgery where possible, then that would be the ideal uh, recommendation. And also we have uh, surgeon and institution factors. Um, you need a good airway team. This involves uh, the ENT team, the anesthetic team, the nursing team, uh, you need the correct instruments, appropriate consumables. Um, every, every, every instrument is as important. And also you, you need a good post-op care. You need a good ICU team as well. In fact, a good ICU team, we can say it does 50%. As we do 50%, the ICU, the rest 50%. 
Yeah, so thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks so much, Aral. That was awesome. That was really nice. Really nice videos and images. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. And it was very clear about what you're actually achieving at Red Cross. And I think that's quite exciting. Um, I just want to check if there's any comments or questions from the floor. I don't see any questions in the chat function or raised hands. Anyone in the questions there? No, you've clearly wowed everyone into silence. There's no questions at all. <laughs> Um, thanks, Raul. That was that was really really nice. Um, and, um, Felicia says great presentation. So well done, Raul. Um, yeah, so we look we will keep watching the space, and uh, we're quite excited to see where this goes. Thank you, everyone. If there's no further questions, um, someone else said thank you for the wonderful presentation. So you've got two compliments. Well done, Raul. Um, oh, sorry. There is actually a question. There's a raised hand from Dr. Muhammad. I'm just going to unmute you. Um, okay. Dr. Mohamed? Yeah, Shazia. Hi. Uh, th thank you. Thank, th thank you very much for the very good presentation. So here in Nigeria, we also see a lot of uh, uh, subglottic stenosis in children and adults. And uh, we do almost the same, only that uh, in Nigeria, we don't have uh, <laughs> the the balloon dilatation. So we improvise with the ET tooth, small ET tooth. Then we use it to do dilatation. And uh, more than 40, uh, more than 90% of uh, patients present uh, with tracheostomy. They are always uh, repaired from other institutions. So they come with tracheostomy. And uh, more than half of them present with quatemia grade four. So we do the same, we do a uh, suspension laryngoscopy and uh, sometimes we use laser to, to excise the lesion, then we dilate and uh, in some cases that we do uh, open approach, we have to put a T tooth, uh, which uh, stents the, the area we resect and uh, we do have a very good uh, result with that. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and thank you Shazia. Um, thanks so much for the question um, and the comment. That was fantastic. Um, and then I see Buche. Um, nice to see you on the chat. Uh, Buche has a question. Uh, let me just try and pull up that question. Uh, Buche says, thank you, Raul. What's the smallest size non-occlusive balloon available? Do you know, Raul? We have this. The six millimeter is the smallest that we use. That's the smallest that we have. Um, Six millimeters. Thanks, thanks, Raul. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I hope that answered your question. Um, I don't see any other raised hands or questions. Um, so I think that was a great presentation. Uh, so thank you, everyone. We'll see you again next week. I'm going to end the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um,